welcome. This is Carl's Rock Hoster Podcast. Today, my guest is Rai Z. Rai is an American guitarist, songwriter, and producer. He also is the founder of Tribe of Gypsies, a Latin influenced hard rock band. Roy Z has produced, performed, and written with the best in the business. Everyone from Judas Priest, Rob Halford, Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden, Sebastian Bach, Ingrid Malmsteen, amongst many others. On this conversation, Roy walks us through his upbringing in Los Angeles, the LA scene in the 80s, all the way to early 90s when he met Bruce Dickinson and his life changed forever. It's with great pleasure that I have Roy on this podcast and I hope you guys will all enjoy. Please do subscribe, do subscribe, follow me, follow the podcast. I'm at Carl Casagrande on Instagram and the podcast is Roller Coaster Carl on Instagram as well. Hey Roy, how's it going my friend? It's going okay, man. I'm uh, happy to be alive. Yes, I know. Me too, my friend. Me too. It's a uh, it's a good day to put everything into perspective. Uh, I guess um, at some point we will talk about something that just uh, uh, reached me and you um, quite hard uh, recent events. But we're not gonna just dive into it just now. Uh, because for me, it's great to be able to talk to you here again. I think last time we saw each other was uh, in Los Angeles last year during the Angra tour. And it was all that crazy moment of being backstage and lots of people around. And then last uh, last February, I was in Los Angeles. We tried to, to go out for dinner, but unfortunately it didn't happen. You were a busy man, so uh, but here we are, and uh, thank you for taking the time to to be on the roller coaster for being on a podcast. Oh, thank you, Carl. I'm 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 really honored. It's been so long since uh, we first uh, we first met. Like I was just uh, remembering the other day talking to to Renato Tribuzzi, a great friend of ours. That uh, via him we end up meeting each other and. And working together many many years ago in Brazil, doing a few gigs and clinics, and I was just talking to my mom earlier on, mentioning that I was going to do a podcast with you, and she was like, "Oh, that lovely guy that came with his wife back then to our house and had lunch with us." I said, "Yeah, that's him, mom. Great memory." <laughs> um, and uh, I'd like to 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 start the conversation with basically just. Uh, you know, asking how how was your bringing in Los Angeles? How was it like? Uh, I know that you started uh, studying music at early stages of your life, but uh, did you did how did the music came into your life? Did your parents bring any sort of uh, influence on you? Was it something that you just uh, developed a taste for it while in school? Uh, just tell me a little bit about that, please. Well, I uh, I grew up. Uh Outside, uh, I grew up just outside of uh, Los Angeles, in Los Angeles County, uh, a town called Pacoima. And uh, Pacoima is, uh, it's very, uh, at the time, you know, it was, it was very, uh, it was a hard place to grow up. Uh, it was, uh, how can you say, it was, uh, you know, it was a rough town, part of town. And, uh, but, uh, we did have a, we did have a beacon of light there and the first Latino rocker ever, uh, Richie Valens was born and raised there. And, uh, so we had, uh, some, and there was some professional athletes, uh, but, uh, basically my upbringing was pretty tough in the beginning, uh, tough streets. Tough streets, and um, did uh, did you did you go to school around that area? Actually, my my first day of school, when I when I was five years old in kindergarten, uh, I was uh, the school was literally a hundred yards away from my house, 
And I got kicked out of school the first day because I got in five fights. <laughs> first day of school. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's not the that's not the best beginning, isn't it? <laughs> did your well, parents did your parents uh, get to uh, did the parents uh, learn about the, the the events that you got kicked out on the first day? Uh, yeah, they they found they eventually found out, you know. Um, It was tough, man. Um, you know, the integration between Latinos and uh, the blacks back then was not easy. And in that part of town, uh, you know, it was more black people than Latinos. And, uh, you know, as you know, when, when you're young, you don't know, you know, that the world is so big. But the, they used to make hell for us, you know, and my uncle, my uncle was in the, you know, he was in the army in Korea and he said I've got to do something I got to I got to help you out here uh, he loved me a lot you know and uh, he said I'm going to show you how to protect yourself and and I think he did a great job so <laughs> <laughs> is there anything in particular that you remember that your uncle uh, would say to you or anything that uh, uh, that like Uh, any sort of uh, advice that he gave you throughout uh, that period or throughout your life? He's yeah. He I remember this like it was yesterday. He said, "Whatever you do, don't throw the first punch." Mm, interesting. Yeah. So in other words, it, after that, it's okay to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. And you know, he proceeded to teach me, you know, some some street fighting, some judo, and. And uh, I just remember these guys just, you know, I'm trying to take my, my, my lunch money, you know. Really? Was it that just, tough? Yeah, it was tough, bro. Wow. You know, and, um, you know, and then the guy, tried, the, the one kid that was my age tried to take my lunch money and I took care of him. And then his best friend that was older came and I took care of him. Jeez. And then his this and then his older brother came and I and, and eventually it, the the first guy's big brother that was in sixth grade I was in kindergarten. Wow. And I I took care of him and then they just said that right you go home I'm like <laughs> call you need to you need to call someone and uh, I told my uncle in Spanish uh, I said as I told my uncle in Spanish I said. Uh, Dio, I need you to pick me up, man. I just got kicked out of school, and my, you know, my mom, my dad, they, they can't know. Mm -hmm. You need to pick me up. And he came and pretended he was my father, <laughs> <laughs> and and then we went, we took off, you know. And was this, went, a, you know, was this a reoccurrence? Was something that you end up like this was your, this was like the first day, but how how did uh, school then unveiled for you? Was it like always year after year this sort of uh, massive challenge to go to school and and then face those um, those ethnical differences and and trying to obviously as a teenager we are always like we were always uh, you, we we basically think we know a lot but when you look back we realize how much how little uh, we knew about life and and the world in general and you're just trying to find your place within. Uh, well, within your own world, with your own self, and then obviously you facing those tough situations put you in a position of where like it's it becomes a little bit about like uh, more more about survival than anything else, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's very natural to to uh, it's really natural to 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 defend yourself. Uh, it's a natural thing. I mean, it because if you run. Uh, they're just going to get you the next day, mm -hmm. you know, and then they'll pick on you even more if you run. So, I mean, that, that whole thing of bullying that was going on and that they tried on me didn't work. Mm -hmm. So I, I ended up going to a school in the same town, but in the more Latino area, it was, you know, I had to walk for about, you know, about 40 minutes there and 40 minutes back home. But it was a whole different situation where I was not having that threat every day of, you know, of this whole ethnic battle that was going on that really, 
I had nothing to do with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it was just, it was just, it was just part of the situation at that moment. Right. And during your time in school, right? Did you what? what so, did music um, kind of like uh, happen on your life? Was it was it something that came via uh, a member of your family? Was it a friend that showed you some music, and then you just started to listen to more music? When was that? Do you remember when was the? If there was such thing as a turning point where you're like, oh my god, okay, great, I'm gonna pick up on the guitar now, or I'm gonna start uh, uh, studying music. Well, I, I'll t I, you know, I, it's it's hard for me to, to, to put it into perspective, but I'll try. Um, when I was born in 1968, uh, I remember I remember a lot when I was really really young. I'm talking months old. Wow! And the Beatles were huge. Jimi Hendrix was huge, and um, uh, I used to, I used to sit down on my grandfather's console, you know, the big consoles with, they had the TV, the stereo, the big speakers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I used to put my little legs through there and pretend I'm playing piano to the Beatles. This is before I'm one years old. I do remember some, and then I'm later on my aunts and uncles and grandma and grandfather, my, you know, my mother, they all filled in the blanks. But they said I couldn't really talk, but I could, I tried to sing along to the Beatles. Mm. And I remember the first song I ever heard, because it, it was a number one song and they played it so much on the radio. I was in my aunt's car and she had a, a you know, a VW bug, like people, everybody did, had a cool, VW Bug, and I remember hearing Hey Jude, and that is the first song I think I ever heard in my life that I remember hearing. Wow. And so, and then they had the Beatles cartoons with the little bouncing ball. That's cool. And, you know, for the lyrics. Mm -hmm. And so my mom says that I would try to sing along and follow, follow this is before I could speak. Wow. Yeah, so I I was a Beetlehead before I was even one years old. You were a Beetlehead before you were... <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's amazing. Very few people can actually say such thing, right? <laughs> I barely but, remember my yeah. teens. <laughs> <laughs> amazing and then but um that's that well that's obviously you know something that uh when when you can remember it and then obviously uh your family around you that they uh they notice that on you it is quite a a, a a a big well it is a big sign that you know this kid has some sort of uh inclination uh, towards music, whatever he's gonna do with that, that's a completely different matter. But but it, it, I think that you know sometimes in life, people. I mean, in you go to school and even parents, they're always like, uh, obviously they have uh, your best interests at heart. Well, not school, but <laughs> but your parents and family. Um, but sometimes because uh, we live in this society that just believes that you know you mm -hmm. have to go to college, you have to get a degree on. In law or go to doctor school or do this or do that you know mm -hmm. follow the, 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 the just the standard road um, they end up missing the people uh, miss on 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 qualities and, and talents that eventually could have led uh, somebody to develop or become really good at something that they are actually really good at you know and not influenced only by factors as, as as money and and and, and status and, and and all of that which on your case he, it was something that you know your family noticed but then did they influence you as you becoming you know a teenager on going towards and pursuing a path and a career on music was something that happened to you or mm, no no i i uh, actually you know i i i you know, I loved the music, and uh, I would appreciate the music. Uh, but my goal was to be a professional baseball player from the time I was about five or six years old. Uh, I became in love with baseball. 
And uh, I played American football as well. Uh, but uh, I spent all of my time just trying to be the best athlete I could be. Uh, and I was lucky that my grandfather, uh, his passion was baseball. He, uh, he owned a team in Mexico, uh, his hometown, El Salto de Jalisco. And he owned that team. And, uh, and, uh, we had, uh, he was an accountant and he had, uh, season tickets, four season tickets of Dodgers for the Dodgers. So baseball was like my life. I would go to games. I would play since I was five. And, you know, that was my dream was to be a professional baseball player. And did you carry on playing and eventually um, what, did you ever get into like um... – a team or something that you were actually going to practices on a regular basis and, and, and really following, like you said, this um, athlete path? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, I had some really good coaches that were influential. And, and later on, I would use their techniques uh, later on in life that they taught me, especially in producing. But getting back to it, yeah, I I, uh, I was very serious. Uh, I played football because, you know, baseball wasn't year round. It's it's seasonal, you know. It's just kind of like uh, just kind of like proper, you know, just like football, soccer is seasonal. Mm -hmm. You know, you can still play it, but all the other kids were playing American football. So then I'd go, you know, I'd go and play. And I also did when I was really young. I did, I did play uh, football, soccer, which is the proper football. Uh, <laughs> and I, tr I tried it, and I was pretty good, you know. And then they said, well, you know, I, I, I was growing really fast. They said you got long arms, so we're gonna try you at goalie. And I didn't want to be the goalie, <laughs> you know. I want to be running around trying to get the ball, you know. Yeah. I want to be a striker, you know. <laughs> like and, every kid wants to, right? <laughs> you know. So yeah. I said, well, you know what? I'm I'm just gonna stick with the two sports. And uh, I, I did a couple years when I was younger, and then of, of football, soccer, and then I just said I'm just gonna stick with uh, with baseball as my number one, and you know, America. American football is great because it teaches you uh, – baseball is a little more in individualistic. It is a team sport, but football is the ultimate team sport. And uh, so I learned the importance of having everybody on the team in tune uh, and being able to you know, make the play, whether it was on offense or defense. And it's pretty complicated stuff. And I, I just loved the the strategic side of it. It was like playing chess almost, mm -hmm. uh, American football. Where baseball, it, there is a lot of chess and there's a lot of thinking. But it's, you know, you get to go up to bat and hit the ball. Mm -hmm. you, get a, you get a chance to hit the ball. And that's where it becomes more individual. Uh, it, you know, and... It's a bit like cricket, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It, you know, and and so you get to go up to bat and make a difference with the bat. Of course, you have defense, and there's so many strategies. But um, I learned so much from sports, and that's what I wanted to do. Unfortunately, later in my years, I had an accident that stopped me from going to university on a scholarship or becoming professional. What, what happened? And, and uh, I almost lost my I almost lost my uh, right foot on a bike accident, and I oh never recovered. God. Wow! And I w I never quite had the speed that I needed again. You know, is it something and, and that influences you nowadays? In, like, if you, for example, you when you walk, or or if you if you decide to go on a jog, is it something that? You still feel it? It still influences you, or is it something that would influence just uh, on, like you said, if you had to use the speed and take it into a more serious level of practicing any any sort of sport? Yeah, no, I mean the it's it's um, you know I'm, when I say I almost lost, it was dangling by just a few nerves. 
Uh, it had actually come off the bone. Ah. And so it's if you touch, it's very sensitive to the touch, but it has endurance. Like I can still run, not as fast. I could still do cuts like in American football. I could run the bases. I could do everything. But it's just that extra speed that you needed to get the attention of the scouts mm -hmm. from from the pro teams and from you know the universe, the big universities. I just didn't have it. Mm -hmm. And you how know? old were you at this stage? Uh, I was in high school, so I was like, I don't know, seventeen. Wow, wow. Yeah, you know, and uh, after that, you know, uh, I was already playing a little bit of guitar, and I was pretty serious. Uh, as that was my hobby was playing guitar started at 13 and, uh, you know, and, but it was more of a hobby. It wasn't like, and yeah, I was practice. I would practice every day for, you know, but once I got hurt, uh, I got first time happened, I got hurt playing football. So that broke my wrist. Oh my screwed goodness. Up my, screwed up my knee. So I was out for a few months, so I would just play guitar. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I Because I, I, I had a broken, you know, I had a messed up knee, torn ACL, uh, and I had a, a broken wrist. But I could still hold a pick with my it, broken right wrist. I could still hold a pick with my cast, and I just kept playing and playing and playing. Next thing I know, I'm playing five hours, you know, a day. Mm -hmm. and uh and, and gradually once i got hurt and I, once i knew i wasn't gonna make it uh to do me live my dream professional foot foot i mean baseball i decided okay well i'm gonna go for music now uh but i did study uh, accounting you know uh that was the family that was what my grandfather was that was what my uncle was and it seemed like a pretty okay living being an accountant, uh, making okay money, and having a decent life, you know. Mm -hmm. So you went to college, and uh, did, so did you finish the degree? Did you did you get a degree in in accountancy? You know what? I di I didn't finish, and I didn't get my degree because I got asked to go on tour. <laughs> oh wow! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, so. welcome to most of people, most of people's <laughs> lives that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> on our in our we never field, you know, it happened to yeah. so many. <laughs> yeah, I, I I had I had uh, I was lucky, man. I I was exposed uh, to here in LA. I was exposed to some really amazing uh, guitarists, and from the age thirteen till now, you know, I I go to, I I love going to concerts, and in nineteen eighty three. There was so much amazing music come out coming out of L.A. Yeah, can you uh, imagine? Yeah, can you imagine how crazy it was? Because you actually lived through that glorious period, which was uh, the eighties, right? And you were there. <laughs> you were right there yeah. when all of those things were happening. Um, yeah. You just mentioned nineteen eighty three, but I think that the whole decade was just. And you were a teenager at that at this point. <laughs> Yeah, 82, 83 were the most amazing times. Uh, Maiden had come out with Peace of Mind, uh, and I got to see them with Saxon on uh, on that tour. Saxon were supporting their new album, Power in the Glory, and Fast Way, you know, um, I had and then uh, I had already seen Maiden on Number of the Beast with the Scorpions. Wow, foreign foreigner, uh, and uh, so it was like like I saw Journey and they were on Escape. I think it was eighty two or eighty three. Wow, uh, like it was like Triumph, uh, fight the good fight. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. like all this music, Dio. You know the first Dio album. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all in all, in this small space. But the thing that really changed my life, 
I went to see a really cool band. I like the guitar player a lot called Vandenberg. And I remember it like it was yesterday. It was April 19th, 1983. And the opening band was a band called Steeler. And the guitarist was a young 19 year old called Ingwie Malmsteen. Hmm. And wow. I saw Ingui, it was his second show, I found out. I thought it was his first, but he clarified. He said, no, that was our second show. And I was front row, and he just blew my mind. And I was you, like, do you remember oh, what, my God. <laughs> That's phenomenal. How many people, I mean, how many people can, can tell that uh, witnessed the second gig of Ingui Malmsteen, you know? This was probably a very tiny gig as well in LA, wasn't it? It was at the Roxy. The Roxy, wow. Right, right next to the rainbow. Yeah. As you know. Mm, my goodness. Wow. I can only imagine because when I think about, um, you know, music and, and rock and hard rock and all of that, I, I always think that, oh my goodness, if only I have, if I had the chance to live the 80s, you know, because the 80s was such an incredible time. I mean, we didn't even touch, like, uh, did you get to see back in the day, like, the likes of, like, Van Halen and Motley Crue and any of these, these other guys back then? Uh, I saw Van Halen later on uh, in 1984. Uh, I never saw them when they played the clubs. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a little bit before my time. Um, I, you know, I uh, I got to see Motley Crue before they got signed. Wow. Uh, I used to go see bands like Motley Crue, Rat, Wasp, uh, you know, other bands that aren't as known, but they were influential, like Warrior uh, and... You know, and uh, I had a friend uh, who's still really close to me, uh, Joe Angel, my friend. I have to mention Joe, and he had a, he still has it. He just got it restored. 1965 Impala with the big tires in the back, <laughs> 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 and he would take me to all the shows, man. Yeah, I was you know? going to I was going to ask how did you make your way to to those gigs and then back home after those gigs. Well, so there was times where I would take the bus and then the bus wasn't running. I remember I did this a few times and then I'd stay too late. The bus wouldn't run at night. So I'd walk to the freeway and then I'd walk. I knew how to get home from the freeway. And so I'd walk on the side of the freeway. Wow. And, and then you walk all the way back home. Yeah, I did that a few times. But most, wow. of, most of the time, most of the time, uh, you know, uh, 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 a California Highway Patrolman would pull me over and go, "What? What are you doing?" <laughs> I said, "I would say, man, you know, I'm lost. I'm trying to get home, and this is the only way I know how to get home." And then the Highway Patrolman would say, "Get in, kid." <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that was that was the early Uber for me. <laughs> <laughs> the early Uber. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, because. In a city not too far, I mean, it's far. Driving is probably about 20 minutes, but it's not that far. In Reseda, there was a play, place called the Country Club, and all of the national and international bands would play there, uh, all of them. Uh, you know, Sa a Saxon and Accept and all these bands mm -hmm. would, play, would play there. I even saw Bruce there with, on Tattoo Millionaire. Wow. He, yeah, he filmed his DVD, his, his, his video there of, of the li live. Oh, I know the video you're talking about. So you were at that gig? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, that's, and, that's, and that's before you, you even met the guy, right? Oh, yeah. Way before, yeah. Wow. That's so cool. That's so mm -hmm. cool. And, and at the time, right, how was it, for example, uh, obviously nowadays with internet and I know here in London you know there were specific areas if specific parts of town where people would just stick uh, you know flyers on the wall seeking for a guitarist or searching for a singer uh, oh I've got this band and we in search for a bass player uh, how was it in LA how did people connected how did musicians connected was it was there a particular 
a, a shop, particular area that people would stick up flyers, uh, or it was just word of mouth. Oh, this guy, that guy. How did that, how did you, how did you get involved with the bands that you got involved back in the day? Well, we did have because being in LA and all, uh, we did have uh, pretty cool resources. We had a uh, BAM magazine, uh, which was like a, it was kind of like L what LA Weekly is now. You know, people that are familiar with LA Weekly, uh, and they had an ad section in the back. The main one, the main other two, the main one was one that was came out every Thursday. It was weekly, called the Recycler. And the recycler was a a, a, a newspaper type. Uh, it was thick, and it had things for sale. It had uh, all kinds of different things for sale by category. It had, you name it, they had it for sale. You know, people would put their ads in, and um, and then they had a section, you know, looking for a singer, and they would have its vocalists drummers you know guitarists basses keyboard play they would have them in categories and so you could put an ad in there and say hey i'm a guitarist looking for a band and These that was my free. influences you didn't have to pay for that yeah you had to pay i had to pay right right yeah, yeah it was like 12 dollars or something per week mm -hmm. or you could get the month for you know 30 bucks or something i don't know mm -hmm. I, I, and it depended on how many words you had mm -hmm. but uh that's, and then we had another magazine called Music Connection, and they had a similar thing, um, and that, that was more of a proper magazine. I think it's still around. Mm -hmm. And um, so you would go in there, and but everything that I ever did, um, excuse me, <coughs> sorry, a little bit of a cough. No worries. Uh, Everything, everything that I ever did, like, you know, uh, in the beginning was just friends, you know, mm -hmm. that you'd meet in school and then you'd put together your little bands, you know, and in school mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you'd do like a talent, talent show at school. And next thing you know, you're, you're trying to learn Maiden and Priest and ACDC and Motley Crue and all this stuff. You're trying to learn it, you know? Yeah. And and then you and then you graduate from that, you know, you, 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 if you were able to keep a band together in school, because uh, there was always a, dr a decent drummer in school. There's always a decent, you know, bass player, you know, a guy that wanted to sing that was okay, you know, mm -hmm. and or we thought at least we thought, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> and, you know. It's like it's like it's like well you know he's got a PA we gotta let him in the band <laughs> yeah <laughs> same old same old <laughs> but then uh, but then from going from your very for from from the first bands that you that you started playing with and and and, and friends that you had in school and and all of that into did did any I mean before you go in and uh, eventually. Um, you know, uh, before the formation of Tribe of Gypsies, you played in several different bands and, and you had several uh, projects that you were involved with. And yeah. did, did any of those bands eventually, uh, did you guys did you guys get to a point where things perhaps started to get serious and for whatever reason, band members started to just not be keen anymore or, or, or something else might have happened? Or was it always just like... Um, amateur level of 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 of, uh, of performing and 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 perhaps music uh, uh writing music yeah i mean i mean um once once uh, at 13 uh, i decided to you know get i still was really serious about sports but i and i was really you know serious about you know uh just being you know, going, taking classes, math and extra math classes and stuff, uh, because I was, I, 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 you know, I thought, you know, if none of this works out, I, at least, you know, I could follow in my grandfather's footsteps and be an accountant mm -hmm. because, you know, I mean, he had, he had an okay life doing, 
but he was also, you know, a businessman and all that. Mm-hmm. And, and so, but I really thought music was something that I loved, that it was ingrained in me going back to that first moment when I was, before I was one, that whole Beatles thing, and then discovering other bands like Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix, all that. I said, you know, I, I you know, I, I seeing Inve, you know, really cha- changed things for me. I was like, you know, this guy's 19. I'm 13. Mm-hmm. I bet you, I bet you, if I try hard enough, when I'm 19, I could probably be as good as him. Mm-hmm. And something crazy happened when I was 19. Uh, just like in the footsteps of Ingbe, Billy Sheehan, uh, uh, Paul Gilbert, and, uh, and, uh, and Vinnie Moore, and all these famous guitarists that came out of Mike Varney. Because Mike Varney had a, col- he had a page, uh, a column in Guitar Player Magazine here in America. Mm-hmm. And, and Mike Varney would get probably thousands of tapes. And he would choose three guitarists a month. And when I was 19, he chose me to be in this column. Wow. And that changed my life. The spotlight column, isn't it? Spotlight, yeah. Spotlight, yeah. A lot of great guitarists came out of there, bro. I can't even... You can look up the list. I mean, you name it. Richie Kotzen, you know, Greg Howe. Tony McAlpine, you name it, bro. Like, you know. Yeah, and how Mike it, Varney uh, get uh, got to know about you or hear about you? Did he see you play live? Oh, how did that happen? No, I sent him. I just sent him a letter and my cassette demo. Wow. Yeah. And what 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 music did you have recorded on that cassette demo? What did obviously obviously I was influenced by. A lot of the European guys like Uli John Roth, uh, Michael Schenker, Vandenberg, uh, Ingve, and I had that kind of classical style, you know, mm-hmm. that was really getting really popular uh, amongst guitar players, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I loved the blues and I loved all the other stuff, but this was it, man. This was like, this was the new thing, you know, mm-hmm. and. You know, learning how to do, you know, this is before YouTube, brother. Of course. You know, it's like <laughs> trying to figure out arpeggios and stuff. It's <laughs> crazy, you know, mm-hmm. and s- scales. I had a great teacher named Ted Labash. He's on my Facebook page. Uh, uh, he's one of my friends. Ted taught me modes and scales and music theory. And uh, so I, I, by the time I was in guitar player, I was cracking i was playing the clubs opening up for big bands with my bands um rph and later on seventh thunder uh was one of my bands when i was really young and then later on i had gypsy moreno and uh what i'm saying is that i really after i after once i decided to do something brother i go all the way how was it for you to then going through all of those experiences and then being uh, on the spotlight column in guitar player and uh, and then playing, going, you know, like you mentioned, Seventh Thunder, Gypsy Moreno, um, Driver Warrior, etc. And, and, and wh- when did uh, the tribe of gypsies started on that? Was that what was it was something that was already uh, you knew already the guys? Or, or, or when exactly did you end up, uh, you know, meeting the guys? And if there was a particular moment that that happened, or, or they were like schoolmates of yours, and then eventually you guys formed the band. When exactly the tribe of gypsies originated? Yeah, that's that. That has a story to itself. So, uh, in 1988, I auditioned for Driver. Uh, I was eight, it was I was 20 years old, and uh, we 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 had a strong campaign here in LA, um, and we did pretty good. But we came we came 
up against a behemoth called grunge. And we were not doing grunge music. We were doing more melodic heavy metal. And uh, we realized it when we played this one gig in, in 80, it was in 88, I believe, Foundations Forum. And one of the band, we were on the bill, and one of the other bands on the bill was Soundgarden. And that's when I said, oh my God, this is going to take over. And it did. And gone were guitar solos. Gone were the screaming. Well, no, Chris was, was we had powerful vocals, but... Gone was the what we knew, mm-hmm. right? Mm. It was something new. And that's when Rob Rock said, hey, uh, you know, I want to keep the band together. L.A. is, this whole, the whole scene is changing. I, I, we can make some money uh, if we go back east. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, I could book us up and down the East Coast, and we can play. And I said, I said, okay, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then the bass player said, I'll do it. He was, he was, he, he didn't care. He was a gypsy anyway, literally. He's from Romania. And the drummer said, sorry, guys, I'm staying here. I already moved from Colorado to L.A. and I don't want to move again. And the keyboard player said, I'm sorry, I can't do it. So we moved back east to the New England area. And um, we tried to settle in the best we could. And we started playing gigs and having, you know, a good run. Well, after that run, Rob Rock said to me, hey, listen, uh, this was 1991 now. He said, listen, Z, I'm so, really sorry, but it was right before Christmas, too. It was kind of a kick, it, it was kind of a kick in the gut. But it, I, Rob is such a great guy. I, you know, I'm not. It, it was the, one of the best things that ever happened to me, honestly. Uh, so I sat, he said, I'm going to go play back with Chris and Pelletieri. And I don't know what to tell you, bro. I know you moved out here and this and that. And so I had a real soul searching, Carl, Mm -hmm. a real big soul search. Mm -hmm. And I looked in the mirror and I said, who are you? Mm -hmm. Where are you from? What kind of blood runs through your veins? Mm -hmm. And I meditated on it for like a couple days. And then I, that's when I wrote down my concept for Tribe of Gypsies. Mm-hmm. And then I said, okay. Then uh, my friend who had been in Driver, Butch Randall Carlson, called me up and he said, hey, uh, I... Uh, We've got a band with Perry McCarty from Warrior, and Perry's one of my favorite singers, and and is now one of my good friends. And uh, he said, "But you'd have to come back to L.A." I said, "Listen, that's the best news I ever had, I ever heard, dude. Hmm. I'm 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 gonna move back home." And so I did. I moved back home. I joined that band, but I still had my Tribe of Gypsies idea. So. I was in that band and I got introduced to Joe Floyd and 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 uh, Sean Kennessy over at Silver Cloud Studios and you know I was still writing my songs on four track and I started playing with Perry and then that turned into me playing with Warrior which had been one of my favorite bands as a kid cuz they did like more more heavy metal that I like, not the L.A. metal, but more of, I don't know what you call it, Teutonic or whatever Mm -hmm. metal. And 
and I kept making my demos. I kept and I kept trying to find people. I kept trying to find people. It was the hardest thing I ever did, Carl. But it took me two years. But um, I did a demo, and I finally recorded my demo on an eight track reel to reel in Burbank, and. I had this demo and I just tried my best to shop it and I had a friend help me, Chris Liebengut, and got nowhere. So I said, oh, it's cool. You know, I gave it a try. Uh, I'm, I'm cool. I'm happy in Warrior. I'm, you know, we're doing metal. We're playing gigs in Hollywood. You know, I'm, I'm, I was a happy guy, but then all of a sudden, a label was interested and then they were visiting and uh the label was called dream circle records german indie label right germany yeah and they had they had another band called seventh seventh sign which featured a, a really wonderful singer liz vandal mm. right mm-hmm. uh and liz was and the, the drummer was Butch Reynolds Carlson from Driver. I was in the band with Perry PTM Perry McCarty from Warrior, and so it was like full. So it was a, really a dream circle. And then the label decided, well, we like Warrior too, so we'll sign Warrior. <laughs> <laughs> and so all of a sudden, I had thirty five thousand dollar budget. Wow. <laughs> which comes yeah. in handy, right? When you're trying to do something with a band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then I put an ad in Music Connection that said signed band, looking for a B3 player, looking for a drummer, looking for this, looking for that. Mm-hmm. And the bass player had been a, a childhood friend. Uh, so I, I said, you got, you, got, you got the gig for bass. And then all of a sudden... Um, he goes, hey, man, I know this guy on Congas, but I, I had auditions like for each instrument, like 40, 50 people. No kidding. Mm-hmm. Wow. But the way it worked out is somebody knew somebody, somebody knew somebody, somebody knew somebody. Next thing I know, I have a I have an awesome band. I don't have the singer quite yet. Uh, but then this one singer uh, who had been signed already, the first signing to Inter- Interscope, uh, which was Neverland. I call him Never Was because <laughs> nothing happened. <laughs> and, uh, Dean, and Dean came in and killed it. And he killed it. And I said, I think we got a band here. And everybody's like, yeah. And we rehearsed really hard. We recorded our record. And, and, and then from there, while mixing our record, we met somebody that changed our lives. Yes, I kind of, I kind of have a feeling that uh, we all know who that person is. <laughs> I'd like to ask you something before we, before before we get into all this, because you mentioned something that I, I myself am extremely interested at, and and I try to live more and more my life, um, looking you know, uh, deep inside myself, looking at myself in the mirror, trying to understand a little bit more about uh, this crazy world we live in and the crazy minds that we have. And you mentioned something about looking, you know, in the mirror and trying to figure out who you were, what blood runs on your veins, and you meditated for a couple of days. So with all that in mind, uh, do you have any particular... Uh, spiritual beliefs do you are you someone is spiritual at all do you have any what, what's your what's your view what, what do you believe if you believe on anything um, I believe that I believe that there's God the road to God there is there are many paths and there are many roads uh, um, I have my own beliefs and I hold them sacred. I mean, I do believe in Jesus Christ, but it doesn't mean that I don't believe in other religions. Mm-hmm. 
it doesn't mean that I believe that it's the only way. Mm -hmm. I believe God is bigger and the universe is bigger than that. So, as you could say, um, as long as it's not a cult, right? Mm -hmm. um, and but do you even, have, in but, even in Christianity, there's some cultism mm -hmm. and some of it. But for me, as long as it's not a cult and you really just believe what you believe, mm -hmm. and there's people believe that there's no God. And I say, good luck. Working that one out, mate. Because I can you. How can you explain all of this existing? Mm -hmm. like, there's, there's, like there's no, there's no, and there's no, but there's do, no two ways about it. There's a higher power. But do you? But do you? Do, is there anything that you practice? Say, uh, you, do you do do you do or try to uh, meditate for for periods of time? Do you? have any kind of uh do you say any prayers for yourself before you go to bed or when you, when you wake up in the morning is there any kind of uh, a spiritual uh, or even religious if you might if you might like it um that you follow on on a daily on a daily basis or 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 that you i don't know is there anything like that that you kind of follow in your life yeah i mean for me it's very primal and simple is uh, try to make every day count. Uh, I try to help people that I really think need help. Mm -hmm. um, I, if I see somebody that's really hungry, um, I try to help them be fed. If, if I see someone that's thirsty, I try to get them something to drink. Um, If I see somebody being treated unjustly, I try to help them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's very simple for me. Uh, for me, religion is, I grew up Catholic, so to me it's more culture. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just in, in, in Rome, you know, and it was beautiful to visit, you know, the Vatican and, and all the different holy places, you know. Mm -hmm. And, but... I also, I also know that you know that a lot of this is man-made. So I, I just really, I, I do say prayers, um, but oddly enough, I'd say about seventy percent of the time, I am able to control my dreams, which is rare, mm -hmm. and I remember all of my dreams. So in my dreams, in my subconscious, I am able to find God's wisdom. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's weird, dude. It's the weirdest thing. Uh, I know, I know there's a lot more to learn, but I feel that when you're in your subconscious and you're in the alpha state of dreaming, that you're open to messages, visions, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, you can get there from breathing, you can get there from breathing, uh, and you can get there from meditating and breathing, mm -hmm. um, and I've gotten there before, and it's really cool, but it's because you're awake in a sense it's kind of can get scary yeah i agree you know you're like whoa i'm traveling and i'm traveling and this is weird and i i applaud people like you know george harrison uli john roth and other people you know that mm -hmm. are able were able or are able to meditate some of my friends And they can go travel and, and and see themselves and reflect on things. But my because I'm I'm kind of like a spark plug. <laughs> 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 It happens for me when I'm in uh, I'm asleep. Mm -hmm. 
And you said that you can remember all your dreams, which is, which Not is great. All Not like, all of them. <laughs> it's just the good ones. <laughs> just a lot. Just no. There's there's weird ones too, but I remember them. I'm able to remember them, and I don't know why. Mm -hmm. But I work out. I think I think I, I I work out a lot of problems, and I think God helps me, allows me to work out a lot of problems, um, and I have visions sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's my beliefs, bro. I mean, other than that, that's amazing. I, I'm open to. I think that as long as you're not hurting anyone, you're not hurting yourself, mm -hmm. and you really are, you have a conviction. I think God is bigger than just one quote-unquote religion I agree 100% 100% I truly believe that you know um, I don't believe in God as being this uh, this guy sitting up there and and judging everyone and having everyone under this uh, under his spell somehow and having all of their lives you know uh, dic I mean that you know there's only one path and and he controls everything I don't see it like that. I believe that God is this massive huge source of energy that uh, everybody and anybody is able to tap into and but somehow we 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 just don't know how to do that because we live in a world uh, that uh, those that, those things are not very encouraged they are not seen with good eyes we don't go to school and learn how to deal with our minds you know for starters we just don't know how to understand what is this thing that is always talking to us, it's always talking to us. There's always this voice, in, voice inside of our heads. How do we deal with that? How do we understand that and try and use that in favor of everybody, not for only for, for ourselves? You know, and it's it's just crazy. I think one of the most important things that we have is the power of God. You know, whatever God you believe, if you believe on this God figure, you know <clears throat> that. Um, that most religious, well, that basically I'm Catholic as well, and Catholicism uh, 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 basically uh, pictures to 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 all of us. And I come from a very religious family as well. And and I think when you when you have the opportunity to travel and see different perspectives, and then obviously uh, for me living 11 years in England now, on a country where uh, so much has happened because of religion, and nowadays people are way more um, well, Church of England, which is kind of like it's totally it's the basis of uh, the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, with some slight changes uh, that men made in order to suit their um, desires at the time, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. No, well, well, well the, ch the, the church for us being Catholic, I see it more as culture. Mm -hmm. It's part of our culture, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, uh, you know, do I feel God in the Catholic Church? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do I feel God in my living room? Yeah. Do I feel God when I'm on a mountaintop? Yeah. Do I feel God when um, I'm, I'm giving a stranger, I'm buying a stranger something to eat? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so God is everywhere in my mind. I don't need to go to a church necessarily. Now, it's nice to hear wor beautiful words. Especially Jesus had some beautiful. The thing about Jesus, people don't realize the guy never had a house. He didn't own anything <laughs> <laughs> except the clothes on him. You know, he was never. He he was always invited. He would hang out with bandits and everything and drink with them. And but he would he would never change. He was always trying to spread love. But that's the thing as well. I, I totally believe and I agree with you. It's uh, obviously for, for us now, uh, 2,000 years, to still be talking about this guy named Jesus. Um, he must have been a hell of a guy, right? Because <laughs> anywhere you I go... Think so, bro. <laughs> his, you... his words, the sequence of words that this guy put together, like... The Lord's Prayer. When I when I examine the Lord's Prayer, I say to myself, like, He just taught you. He just told you how to pray to God. 
Yeah. And he doesn't talk about – he doesn't do it in a way that's – um makes you feel ashamed. Yeah. Yeah. But don't you think as well that, 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 that those words and everything else, ha they, they have changed – and be they have uh, I mean men adapted throughout the years, a lot. Um, yes, yes, and yes, and yes. But there are some, there are, there is some backup, Carl. That with there were spies for the the Pharisees that would follow Jesus, called scribes. Mm -hmm. And these scribes didn't necessarily believe in Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And same goes for Buddha, same goes for Allah. People would just write down what these guys would say and what they would do and what they would witness. They would, didn't have an opinion, mm -hmm. you know? It was the video camera of the day was a scribe because mm -hmm. the scribe was supposed to be neutral and just write down the day's events mm -hmm. and report back to the Pharisees. And a lot of, a lot of, lot of what somebody like Jesus did, um, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of what Buddha did, a lot of what, uh, you know, a lot of what Allah did, a lot of what these holy men did was just written down, bro. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, we had a YouTube on them, you know what I mean? It yeah. Like... <laughs> <laughs> no, that never ever happened. No, absolutely. It was, um, you know, it was, it was, it was ink and, and, and whatever type of, you know, uh, whatever type of, I don't even think they had paper. They had something else, you know, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that they wrote on. And, and, uh, so the events by all the main, religious i say religious i shouldn't say religious all the main channels the 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 prophets of god throughout the world uh you know native americans it was they didn't even write stuff down they just handed it from I mean, mouth to mouth you know mm -hmm, yeah the elders would teach the, the younger adults and then they would teach the children mm -hmm. and it was just handed down and so i just believed it it, it, to close it, I just think there's more there's there's more than one path to God, and it all lies within ourselves. One hundred percent, I agree. I think we are all beacons to to light. You know, I think we are yeah. all. I think we are all. Uh, we are so vulnerable to energy in general, all of us, mm -hmm. way more than mm -hmm. we can possibly comprehend because nobody teaches us about it and we don't talk about it. Uh, right you end up talking about those things the the older you get and the more interested in 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 things that are not as superficial as uh well the things that are basically around us in, in this physical world and some people never really get their hands or, heads around it most a lot of people never really get interested in discussing those subjects but but regardless of that we are all very uh, uh um What's the word now? Slip my mind. Just uh, very open to anything that is around us and things that surround us, the, the, the people that we know, the attitudes that we have, the words that come out of our mouth, the way that we think. You know, this is actually scientifically proven that every thought you have, you actually emanate a frequency out there. You know, you emanate a frequency. And if it's positive, you will end up vibrating and connecting to positive, positive things around in your life. If you think negative, it's going to be the other way around. You know, and all of those things obviously play a massive role, I believe, when uh, on pursuing things in life. You know, which direction are you heading? Am I going to uh, be uh, this or am I going to be that? Am I going to uh, help people? and put people uh, in front of my needs or am I gonna just 
look at myself and just do good to myself and then just you know uh, uh, I know it's just uh, it's a very broad broad conversation broad subject you know that uh, we definitely should uh, make some time to, to talk more about it in, in, in the future but uh, but then obviously you see how interesting it is I just asked something in regards of uh, uh, meditation and in regards of uh, um, uh, spiritual and religious beliefs and we completely you know took a different path on the conversation we were having and I think that's amazing that's magical that's beautiful but it's inevitable to get into what uh, basically like you just said you know let's pick up from the moment of what you just said earlier on that it changed basically the course of your life and I don't know how much it changed for the other musicians that were involved with you at the time on Tribe of Gypsies, but uh, uh, but everybody knows for sure how much it changed for in a very extremely positive way your life. Uh, the moment when you met uh, Bruce and you guys end up um, when he handpicked uh, you and and Eddie and David and and Doug and and to complete his solo band. So. Uh, how did that happen? Well, because at the time you you were not. I mean, like you said, you were already playing lots of gigs. You were involved with so many bands. You had a demo recorded. You got you know this deal with the German uh, indie label. And but at the time you did, uh, and you were on the magazine as well. I mean, you were a well-known musician on the scene. I but... was already a professional producer too. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, my band. Uh, my by then my band downset that I was working with, I, it wasn't my band, but I was like the, the, I was the George Martin of the band. I was the fifth Beatle. And uh, they had just gotten signed to Mercury Records. Uh, and so I was, and I was producing a lot of artists. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, and I, and so I, I produced a lot of artists and uh, I was already working with a lot of artists. I had a lot of experience already by the time I met Bruce. Mm -hmm. um, and then my band was really, really together. Um, we had, I mean, Madonna used to come to our shows. What? Seriously? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. God, that's yeah. a big fucking deal. Yeah. I, I don't have the pictures. I don't know who does, but there's, there's several pictures us with Madonna she loved us because you know she loved she loves Latino music and we I thought we had the perfect balance of of Latin music mm -hmm. including including Samba my friend oh wow and 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 we had the, the all of Latin and African influence with rock mm -hmm. you know my my idea was listen let's put this all of this together with you know, the Woodstock, Jimi Hendrix, you know, when he had a conguero, he had a congas, and he had all these crazy people. And he said, he goes, we're nothing but rainbows and something. We're just a band of gypsies. And I said, well, that's the name of the band, Tribe of Gypsies. And, uh, and we had a lot of momentum. We had a lot going for us before we even met Bruce. Oh, I get it. Okay. Okay, the meeting Bruce was like, hey, I'm Bruce. I really love what you guys did. Um, he goes, he goes, uh, he goes, uh, do you, you, I love your band. I want to help. Well, what can I do to help? And I said, well, I don't know. We're signed to this label. And he's like, did you have a lawyer look at it? I go, yeah. And he's already like, Bruce is to the point, like, did you already have a lawyer look at it? Yeah. <laughs> did you, did you do this? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'm working on my album and after hearing your album, I think my album is not as good. <laughs> <laughs> that's Put such a good, that's such an amazing to compliment to you, right? <laughs> I don't want to repeat what he what he the way he phrased it, but basically said your album just killed my album. I just spent half a million dollars making my album, <laughs> and you spent and your your budget is what thirty five thousand total, including mix. Mm. I go yeah, 
And he goes, okay, there's something wrong here. <laughs> because I hate my album and I love yours. <laughs> he Is didn't that... say, he didn't use the word hate. I should take that back. He used the word, it's, I like your album better than my album. Fair That's enough. what he said. Is it the album that he produced that never saw the light of the day with Keith Olsen? Is that the one? That's right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. What happened to those tapes? They, they vanished. Do you really? <laughs> yeah, I have them. Amazing, because some stuff I think it came out as B sides on some of the singles of Balls to Picasso. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I have them. What happened is, uh, what happened is Keith, uh, Keith pretty much abandoned his studio, and a good friend of mine, Paul Martinez, who's worked on me in a bunch of productions, including uh, Halford and Sebastian Bach. He goes, hey, man, uh, they got all these tapes here, and I saw these Bruce Dickinson tapes. Um, and I said, really? I said, dude, do me a favor and just grab them, grab them, dude. Mm. And he did. And then um, because they were recorded on a, on a Sony 24-track digital, I knew a friend that had it. I had the same machine, mm -hmm. and I said, "Listen, man, well, how much for me to go in and transfer these tapes to Pro Tools?" Mm -hmm. And he said, "I'll give." He goes, "If it's for Bruce, because he knew Bruce as well." Mm -hmm. And um, Jimmy Crichton, bass player for uh, Saga, had a studio in the same area, Sound City, Good Night LA. Then it was Jimmy Crichton Studio. Then it was uh, another rehearsal studio where Dio rehearsed and a bunch of other people. All in one little area, bro. Wow. Like, like I'm talking small little area mm -hmm. uh, of the Sound City complex. And I said, Jimmy, please. And so I, Jimmy let me go in. I transferred all of Bruce's tapes. I have them for him. He still hasn't picked them up. He's been here many times after, but... He's like, oh, Z, I don't have room. I'm like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he he didn't like his album. And then he decided, you know, he goes, hey, come to England. Let's write a few more tunes for my album. I said, sure. You know, I went. It was my first time in England. And then I went. And um, in one week, we had like seven or eight songs. Wow. Yeah. And he goes like, well. He goes, what do you think we should do now? I go, I have no idea. I go, I like the songs we have. He goes, he goes, uh, I, I got to spend some time at home. Are you okay with like recording here in the UK? I'm like, sure, sure, I, I'm, I'm cool. He goes, all right, well, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's just plan on it then. Um, let me work things out. I'll get back to you. So he asked me, who do you want to use on this and that and the other? I said, well, look, man, the guys I trust the most are my bandmates just because we, you know, that's the vibe that you want, that you heard. Mm -hmm. And he's like, let's do it. So we did it. And Bruce had done that before with Skin, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where he got a whole band that was already together and he would work with them because they already – he didn't have to worry about chemistry because they already had it as a band. Mm -hmm. It, you know, Bob Dylan did that with with the band. You know, Bob mm -hmm. Dylan and the band. Yeah, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he was smart about it, and he's like, "I said, listen, man, everything would be cool. Just try to involve as much as you can. I'll take a pay cut, whatever." And then we did Balls to Picasso. It was very experimental, and then the last. The red, last red herring was Tears of the Dragon. He goes, he was going to use Keith's version. And he goes, this doesn't fit, does it? I go, no. I go, no, it doesn't fit. <laughs> but, it's like, but everybody from the tribe was already sent home. And I said, I don't know, Bruce. I go, I could try to superimpose myself but i don't even think the draw you know it's everything and he goes well what do you suggest i said well listen 
Dickie's a great drummer. We got we got, already got the sounds. Dickie Flizzar, you know, he was mm -hmm. in Bruce's solo band of touring and you know, he was in skin. Mm -hmm. I said, just go get Dickie over, I'll do the bass. Uh, I'll do the guitars and uh, just get Dickie over, you know? I think, you know, you just have Dave, Dave home and Dickie's here in town. Let's just, let's just knock it out and see if we can beat Keith's version. Yeah. I, and I'm not saying that we beat Keith's version, but Keith's version didn't fit in the album. And then once he said, okay, I'm liking this better. And I said, all right, well, I need to write my solo, man, before we do the drums. And um, so I did my, I worked out my solo. It took me like a day. I wrote, that's, I've never write solos, but I wrote that solo out. That, and that's one of the solos that are, I mean, you know, when you listen to a solo and if you listen to the song, you want to, if it's a cover band performing the song, you want the guitarist mm -hmm. to play the solo note by note because the mm -hmm. solo is so much important on that song. It's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's so, uh, it, it just gra you. it just grabs you in a way. It's just one of those, so it's just like, I don't know. I mean, I'm not over, over exaggerating, but for me, it resonates just like, you know, a solo like Slash on Switch Out of Mind, for example. Those very iconic solos that you hear it, you listen, you know. If you if you like the song, if you know the band, you know who's perform, you know who's playing the song, and you know the solo note by note. It's just one of those that you know. Don't mess around with that solo, man. If you want to play Tears of the Dragon, you do the solo note by note, please. <laughs> or at least, or at least try. Or at least try exactly. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I never, I've, I've never, I've never done it perfect, perfect note for note, but. It's it's hitting the key moments, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And um, how, so, do you remember you know, how many? Do you remember I, I, how many times? Mm. I I wrote the solo, and after that, you know, I laid it down. I think it was like I did one punch in, and that was it. That's exactly what I was going to ask. How many takes did you do to get the solo? <laughs> one and a half. Wow, that's so pretty much what you hear in the album. Is what you executed on the day on the go. Yeah, I wrote it out. In, I wrote it out in notation. Wow, wow, mm -hmm. that's really cool. Yeah, I wrote it. I wish I could find the manuscript for that. I wrote it out, and then, um, and then Dicky came in, Dicky the drummer, the day after I laid the solo, and he listened to it, and he goes. I saw, I could see his, you know, I could see his German mind just like working, working. And he heard it one time and he goes, play me back that solo part one more time. And then we played it back for him and he goes, okay, I'm ready. And I, I, I went, uh, just, I, I wasn't the official producer, although I was already producing, but I wasn't the official producer at that so I went out while he did his drums and I had headphones and I just hung out with him mm -hmm. uh, and I did air guitar. Air guitar before air guitar was a see. thing. <laughs> yeah, it's just so he could see like what was going to go. And he did the whole song in one take. Oh, wow. Him as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. And why at that time, for example, uh, it, this end up happening down the road, but like why, for example, uh, on the tour, on the tour supporting the album uh, on the Balls of Picasso, why at that time, w w were there conversations at the time for your band to go on the road as well and then something happened or at the time this was never considered and it's something that just uh, happened to be uh, later on when you guys end up working on Accident of Birth and Chemical Wedding? Um, it was, it was kind of, it came to Bruce as a shock. And I said, listen, um, I never intended to, to tour with you on this. My band just got signed to Mercury Records. 
uh, this is after Dream Circle Mercury picked it up. Mm-hmm. And I said, I'm, I'm like, I was, it was hard for me because I wanted to help him. But uh, my own band that I had been working on and what visualizing and everything else got a, a major deal. Mm-hmm. You know, and this was for four hundred thousand dollars. Holy crap! Back in the time, yeah. back in the day. Oh my God! Sounds like an well, it is a nut uh, <sighs> dream nowadays for any any artist that kind of budget, isn't it? Yeah, and it wasn't about the money, uh, but it was about the opportunity. And we, but we had a lot of labels that wanted us, and I said, Bruce, I go, I'm really sorry. And he really got mad at me. <laughs> Did he? <laughs> yeah. But it was the way I phrased it. And I won't repeat the, repeat the phrase. But I basically said, listen, man, I'm doing my band. I did you the record that you wanted uh, or I thought you wanted. Uh, you've, got a, you've got a hit with, uh, with Tears of the Dragon. Um, I, I'm really sorry. That's why I'm not in the videos and stuff, just so you know. Hmm. Uh, and he even car- he carried that animosity even into Accident and Birth, which is okay. But did he invited uh, you then back in the day to to be on the band and go on the road and then because of the deal with Mercury? Yes, he did. Right. He did. Right. He and, did. And I said, uh, unfortunately, I have to decline. My band is... That we're must going have, back. Mm, but we're, that, going, but, we're going... Sorry, go ahead. Now, yeah, that must have been like a very, very, very tough decision for you as uh, as obviously um, a musician, as a producer that you already been at the time. And not only that, but as a music, uh, a, a rock and metal fan as well, right? Because at the end of the day, you were working with, with a guy that you always admire from being in a band that you saw when you were like... 13 or 15 years old back in 82 and 83 so it must have been for you such a hard decision to make or was it something that it was the tribe of gypsies vision was so clear in your mind that for you it wasn't actually that hard no it was hard it was hard it was more than hard and i i i once i told them my decision i the right words didn't come out and he took it personal. I had to write him a letter. And then he was okay after that. But then he decided to form Skunk Works. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. he was friends with... Um, oh, what's the guitarist's name? I can't Alex? think of his name right now. Huh? Alex, Alex. Dixon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Alex. He was already friends with Alex. And... Alex, by then grunge had really taken over Mm -hmm. and they did, you know, they toured, which was beautiful. They toured on the boss Picasso, which ended up them doing that show in Sarajevo, Mm -hmm. uh, which everything happens for, for a reason, Carl, Mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that beautiful experience is now a movie and, everything else Mm -hmm. uh and bruce and then i was living in london at the time oh were you i didn't Uh, know that so you lived in london for a while yeah i'm i uh i'm i uh i accidentally married uh, not accidentally but i married uh iron maiden's lawyer (laughs) 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 <laughs> that part I didn't know. <laughs> Accident- I accidentally married. I made his lawyer. <laughs> well, she, she was a pretty good lawyer, I bet. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> that explains it all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Roy, your character, man. I love it. <laughs> and how long did that last then? How, how, how long did you live in London then? Uh, on and off, you know, 
more 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 here than there, but on and off for about seven eight years. Wow, wow, a long time. Yeah. And at this yeah. point, then Mercury, you guys have a deal with Mercury, and that's when you started uh, working on what would become the first uh, Tribe of Gypsies album, which came out. Excuse me. No worries. Which came out in 1996, which is just the year before you you guys did Accent of Birth. So, what, what happened then? So you had this deal with Mercury, and then Tribe and of Gypsies. And then G it fell apart. It fell apart. They fired everybody. Oh. On the label. Oh my! They fired, God. they fired everybody on the label, um, and I'm like, I was so st I felt stupid because I had other labels, less money, but I had other labels that wanted me, you know, including Ted Templeman wanted to produce the band who produced Doobie Brothers and Van Halen, mm -hmm. and the early Van Halen, and Warner Brothers wanted us, Madonna wanted us, Sylvia Rohn at Atco wanted us uh like all these labels wanted us man but i went there just because uh they said we'll sign all your bands all of your bands will sign them all they even signed bruce no kidding for america yeah oh wow wow yeah they but signed everything i had and i had like five bands so they signed them all but then they dropped the deal with tribe of gypsies they said, uh, we can put out the record, but we're not going to promote it. And I said, screw that. I, I got my lawyer. We went to court. It took two years, but I got my album back. It didn't have to pay back the advance. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that's good. So you had the album by then. And then, um, but you, well, that, that must have been a very hard moment as well, yeah. considering that you just yeah. turned a gig, turned down a gig with Bruce. To pursue yeah. that, and when you uh -huh. are going for that, all of a sudden the label drops you, and it's just like this clash of of things happening, and and then you feel a bit stuck. I bet, right? That probably felt a bit stuck, like fuck, you know. When I'm thinking that, you know, things are going and moving uh, exactly the path that I always dreamt, things are kind of like collapsing. Did you ever feel like, uh, and in, in one of those moments, how? Was there any particular moment that you you don't have to get too much into it, but that you felt like, oh my god, I just thought that everything I was doing was right, and then now I don't know. And then you start. We always have those moments in life, but what was this one? One of those moments that you question yourself, Jesus, am I making the right decisions on my life? Yeah, no, I, no. I'll be I'll be very clear. I was pissed off. I was pissed off because. Um, even when we were showcasing, the label was playing dirty. When we were already off, uh, off, not technically off, but we were no longer with the label, we played South by Southwest, and a bunch of labels showed up again. And the new president didn't want to lose, didn't want us to succeed. So he told them, "That's my band," which technically was correct, but we were already. In, in, we were in final stages of, litiga of, of litigation to get off of the label uh, and he scared away all the labels at South by Southwest in 1995 hmm. the so it was fucked up dude I was really pissed off mm, and by then all the other labels that were interested were like, well, no, you, you, it's kind of like when you try to get a girl, like you pick the girl, the other girls that liked you, mm -hmm. basically by picking that girl, you told them to fuck off. Mm -hmm. And now you're going like, Hey, do you want to go out on a date? And they're going to say like, fuck off. What am I, what am I, what am I second best, third best? Like fuck off. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. And, we were forced to go away in the, you know, we, we tried and, you know, and then by then I was like, okay, well, you know, I was still living, you know, we're still in London and, and I remember this like yesterday, uh, Bruce's wife is American and, uh, Patty and she, she decided to have a 4th of July party and invite me cause I'm American mm -hmm. and, which is funny and ironic because 
you know, that's that's the celebration of America's indep- independence from uh, Great Britain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Quite from ironic, England. Yeah. <laughs> so so how about have a Fourth of July party in London is pretty funny to me. <laughs> <laughs> In a very British household. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, that's when I saw Bruce, and I said, "Hey, I hadn't seen him. He, he's been mad at me, and this is a couple of years have gone by." And he's like, "Hey, how's it going, Z?" I'm like, "Cool, man. What's up?" He goes, "Oh, I got Skunk Works. We're doing this, that, and the other." I go, "Cool, man." I go, "He's like, what are you up to?" I go, "Oh, you know." I'm still plugging away with the tribe. I'm writing. I'm writing. I got a lot of material. I'm gonna get back to America next week and start up on that. And he's like, "Really? Yeah." I go, "Yeah." I also got some really cool metal stuff I just wrote out of nowhere. And he's like, "Really?" I go, "Yeah, man. I got some really cool metal stuff." I go, "In, in, in actuality, it's pretty has a bit of." that British, good old British metal sound to it. And he's like, really? I go, yeah, man. I go, you want to check it out? You know, <laughs> give me a, give me a call in a week. I'll play some stuff over the phone. Cause that back then we didn't have the WhatsApp or the Skype or nothing. Mm-hmm. We had the phone and that was it. Mm-hmm. So t- week later, Bruce calls me and he's like, all right, Z, You've had me. He. What did he say? You've had me in a bit of bit of suspension, uh, animation, or something. He's. I forget what he said, but he's like play this stuff. <laughs> so I. So I'm playing him the the first the five songs that I had, and he's after I played him everything. He goes, I'll be I'll be over there in three or four days. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> and were those yeah. songs? Uh, were those songs some of the songs that eventually would be in the Accent of Birth album? All of them. All right. Okay. I had I had Accident of Birth. I had Star Child. I had The Magician. I had uh, Taking the Queen. Beautiful tune, by the way. And I had Arc of Space. Hmm. Amazing, amazing. Those were the and, ones that. Caught his uh, caught his att- his attention over the phone and and eventually made what was gosh I remember at the time that those that that, that album came out it was just like a lot of people on the media saying that that was the best I had made an album since Seven Son of a Seven Son <laughs> some people would say at the time I personally think that that was honestly Accident of Birth and Chemical Wedding are so 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 good it's something that you know it, it's just a band that uh you would always want to have that band around regardless of iron maiden you know because it was very metal but it wasn't iron maiden it was more technical than iron maiden it was more um it was more, a, more a bit, in 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 ways more complex than maiden and rawer than maiden and i don't know man there's something about that music that you guys produced at the time that is just, um, it's just, it's just too, honestly, it's too, too, uh, those two albums are like masterpieces in my opinion, and they really are. Accent of Birth was just like, oh my God, this is it, you know, this is it. And it follow and, and the album promote. I mean, the album went extremely well, didn't it? Like the promotion was just like ridiculous, the touring and all of that. But uh, I think I'm putting myself a little bit too ahead of the game here now. But um, what then? He flew to the U- he flew to over to the U.S. And then you guys worked together on the album. And then when the idea no, bring- we worked on we worked on the five songs, and he put together his vocal ideas, and he, and he, and he said, "Well, I noticed I noticed you have a lot of twin guitars." I go, "Yeah." I go, "I you know it's just I go it's natural for me. I mean, to me, a metal band, a real metal band, should have two guitar players." He goes, hmm. He goes, what would you be okay if uh, I talked to Adrian Smith about maybe uh, doing this with us? I'm like, what are we doing, Bruce? 
and he starts laughing. He goes, we're going to do an album. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, listen, man, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Uh, tell, you know, tell Adrian that he's more than welcome. and We'll work it out. Um, and, uh, so then I wrote some more songs. Bruce came over and I picked up Adrian from there. I remember I, I had my Mustang and I picked, picked up Adrian. He's like, he, I could tell he was scared by the way I was driving. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to drive like, you know, like I thought I was in, uh, in a Formula One race or something, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> hey, man, I had a 5.0. What do you want? You not know? anymore, right? <laughs> I still have it, yeah. I still have it. <laughs> but you're not driving uh, like a Formula One driver No, these days. no, I drive like a grandpa now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, too, too many tickets. So anyway, uh, uh, but anyway, yeah, I, I, and then I remember we just, you know, I, I said, hey, man, um, Adrian, I remember picking them up. I hope you up. guys enjoyed like, this man, conversation, this, is cool, man. Thank this you podcast. And, and then I could see, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm it. like, don't worry, dude, so, I got this. If that's <laughs> the case, I'm driving on please the do follow like, you know, on Instagram the 405, at Roller Coaster. You know, they call it 405 because it takes about myself four or five at Carl hours to get there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> on Twitter, is it really the same <laughs> thing? Facebook, <laughs> same thing. And, but I know uh, all the side streets, and I'm like do going all crazy. Like you, subscribe He's just kind of like, all right, I was like, That's don't worry, very, dude, please. Very much and um, he gets Thank to my house. He's like, and you got anything great, to drink? I go, I got, great, I got. You want a beer? He goes, yeah, I have a beer. Because he was all nervous from the drive, and yeah. But from that moment on, man, we were we became friends, and you know, later bandmates, and mm -hmm. it was beautiful, man. And even to this day, Adrian and I are, you know, I, I feel like we're more than just bandmates, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, and we had a lot of fun uh, together, and uh, but yeah, that's what happened with that man, that whole situation. And uh, the the touring, the touring of, <laughs> of no worries, the touring of those two albums. How was the how 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 was being on the road with all? Well, obviously you had uh, your friends from Tribe of Gypsies, and then Bruce and Adrian. How was the chemistry between all uh, aside uh, being on stage, like off stage? Was uh, were the vibes great between everybody? Like obviously, Chemical Wedding Tour wasn't as as big as Accident of Birth because it it almost didn't happen, right? Because Bruce was Bruce and Adrian were going getting back going back to Maiden. But uh how was the how was the vibe on the road? Well, I mean, uh the road the road when we did uh we did America uh I was having at the time I was having a couple health things so it was difficult for me uh, in America doing it and then by the time I got to the UK they figured out what was wrong with me health wise uh, and um, fixed it and then um, did the European tour to Japan European tour everything on accident of birth then um, then uh, I wrote a lot of the chemical wedding in, in the UK. Uh, I would walk around, you know, in London and just like, it was, you know, it was crazy, but with an acoustic guitar and a handheld uh, recorder and I'd get an energy and I just write, mm -hmm. you know, I'd go to Hyde Park, I'd go, you know, to, to, you know the the, the towers. You know mm -hmm. Tower Bridge. Mm -hmm. I go to that area. I go, mm -hmm. go all the you know and just write. And I was writing some pretty crazy stuff. And uh, and then uh, and then Bruce heard it and he's like, and I was also writing my album, uh, mm -hmm. Tribe of Gypsies, Revolution Thirteen, and uh, I was writing two albums at the same time and they both came and out on the same year right yeah yeah mm. well they were made back to back mm. 
they were little. I made I made the tribe one, and then had two days off, and then I did the Bruce one. Wow. Uh, yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. After that, after accident, the chemical wedding, we made it, and then I in the beginning I told you that uh, my grandfather was really important in my life, mm-hmm. and they said. Uh, Look, your grandpa's really sick. He's going to need heart surgery. And it was time to go on the road for chemical wedding. And I told Bruce, I can't go. I'm really sorry. But I choose family over everything. But my guitar tech, Richard Coretti, also known as the guru, he... uh I said, the guru, I taught him everything. He knows everything. And Bruce said, okay, I understand. He goes, because I lived with my grandfather too, and I was partially brought up with my grandfather. So I understand. I said, listen, if I'm not if I'm not there for my grandfather, I don't think he's going to make it. Uh, and Bruce goes, like, how so is he? I go, listen, man, him and I have – a connection that he doesn't have with any of his children and not even he has a different connection with me than he does with my grandmother. Like he's very competitive. He owns his own baseball team. And so if he sees me, feels me and he hears me and I talk to him about the baseball and those things, it's going to energize him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Bruce said, all right, Steve, this is really hard for me to swallow. He goes, this is the second time. He goes, you did, you did it to me on balls, and now you're doing it to me. I go, I'm not doing anything, dude. Take Dave, take Eddie, but I cannot do the Europe with you. I'm really sorry. I have to pick my grandfather over you, and I hope you understand if you don't. You know, I don't I don't mind you getting mad, but I'm not going to I'm I'm sorry. I have no regrets. And that's what happened. They did the tour without me in Europe. And then uh, my grandfather made it okay. And Bruce said, hey, I want to do a live album. Can you at least come over and do the album? I go, well, if I'm going to come over, I might as well play. <laughs> yeah. And then we did, we literally did the uh, South American tour. And that was it. They were back in Maiden. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that because I was, um, I saw the show in Rio. I think it was the old Metropolitan, which is a huge, mm-hmm. huge venue in Rio de Janeiro. I don't know. That's what, like... Uh-huh. Six, seven thousand people, and at that time, I remember like in Sao Paulo, it was what like three of that venue that the live album was recorded, which was like five thousand capacity each night or something. It was just a crazy time, wasn't it? Massive, we massive did, shows in Brazil. Did, yeah, we did two shows, and then I said, uh, Bruce goes, I, I told Bruce, we don't have the show. He's like, What do you mean? We don't, I go, We don't have it, it's not good enough. I just been up all night and all day, all this morning, listening. We don't have the show. He uh, he goes, all right, we're going to schedule a show for the next day, which was a Sunday, if you remember. Mm-hmm. So we did three shows, and then we had the whole concert, which became Scream For Me Brazil. Uh, but... Uh, we were having a lot of technical difficulties. Um, they filmed it and they they messed up the filming because of there were so many technical difficulties. Yeah, the um, video, that's why it never came out on video. Yeah, which is an absolute shame, isn't it? Because the energy, mm-hmm. the energy of those shows, it was unbelievable. It was seriously unbelievable. I mean. You know, you go to a Metallica concert, you go to an Iron Maiden concert, you know what to expect, and you know it's always going to be a celebration. But that was like, 
that was really like a new band. It was like, you know, Bruce had obviously Tattered Millionaire and Balls to Picasso. And, but, but those two albums, you know, Accident of Birth and Chemical Wedding, that was a vibe, man. There was there was an energy. There was like a passion from, from the fans. That was amazing. And it was because of the music of those two albums. It was not the case that Bruce was like, you know, two albums out and then playing like a handful of tracks of the albums and the rest of the show is Iron Maiden. No, there was no Iron Maiden. I mean, I think you played Flight of Fickers maybe on the Chemical Wedding Tour in the end. But on the X... Uh, yeah, we played like... And the prisoner, prisoner, and and two minutes to midnight. Yes, true. So those three, but on the accident of birth tour, there were no, there was no maiden songs, as far as I can remember. Yeah, there was, there was, uh, two minutes to midnight, uh, power slave. It's only songs that Bruce and Adrian wrote. Yeah, we wouldn't do, we wouldn't do anything that anybody else wrote. Yeah, but that but, was the rule. But 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 but, but regardless, I mean, it, this is this consisted of what like uh, uh, ten, uh, like you know, like a very. I mean, you play fifteen songs and you play three songs from your old band, but you have and you have those sold out shows for thousands and thousands of people that are going to see you because of the new material. That's extremely impressive, and that's down to you know. The work that you guys did together, but obviously, you know, a lot of what you did, you know, the music that you wrote, that it's totally like immortalized on, on those albums, and and you know, uh, thank you, thank as, you, as 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 obviously as an admirer and 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 a fan for and foremost, it's like, uh, you know, not me, but I bet there's lots of other people out there that you know would love to to see more coming out of those two guys which is you and bruce you know like to have more well, of you that. know we did we did tyranny of souls and it, and um it was funny uh uh last time i saw bruce uh uh dave dave uh, uh dave moreno who's now plays in puddle the mud who played on tyranny of souls he asked bruce hey bruce what which out of all the albums which one's your favorite solo album and bruce said Tyranny of Souls, and we're like, what? I'm like, dude, what about Chemical Wedding? Are you crazy? And he's like, <laughs> sorry, Z. He goes, that's my favorite album. He, he, like Dave asked, so I told him, that's my favorite album. I'm like, okay, man, well, to each his own, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's crazy I mean, because Tyranny of Souls, it's an amazing <laughs> album, but there was never one single concert in support of the album, right? No, that's crazy. No. I mean, I mean, how many? <laughs> It's just really crazy when 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 you struggle to find like uh, amazing music and then eventually you have albums out there and then this particular one it's an album that was never performed live you know and it's we snuck it in we snuck it in what happened what happened is um, I wrote a bunch of songs Bruce said I'm going on tour I'm gonna be bored. Um, do you got any songs laying around? I go, yeah, I've got twenty songs, Bruce. In the style, in, in 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 our style, of the Bruce Dickinson band now, and he's like, no, you don't. <laughs> I go, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I mailed him a CD with twenty songs, and he literally picked the first ten. And he worked on them on the road. And by the time he got to L.A., he had they had two shows in L.A. And total of four days. But he had, you know, basically before each show, he had, I mean, he had, he had two shows in a row. He had the afternoons of the two shows. And then he had one day before they traveled to Mexico, I believe. And he goes, I want to do my vocals before the maiden gigs. Wow. I'm, I'm like, really? I'm like, I go, okay. Um, that will, I go, that's fine. We'll have a quota. I go, I was thinking already, like, because when somebody says they want to do something, I say, okay, let's go. Okay, here's our quota. I need you to be able to do three songs, three songs, 
and then four songs the third day. Do you think you can do that? And he said, not a problem, Z. I have all my words. Well, he did the first gig, and it happened to be Nichols' birthday that night on the first gig. And, or no, the night before the first gig in L.A., and someone and they got cake on some of the high, high scaffolding staging. And Bruce, during the show, it got moist, and Bruce fell like 60 feet right on his side. Fuck. And he broke like three ribs. Oh, my gosh. I don't remember that. Yeah. So the second day of Terry and Soul's recording, Bruce had broken ribs. And he still showed up. And he gave me four takes of each song. And in between takes, the guy was literally crying. Uh. He goes, Z, I, I got to lay down. Hold on. And he would hold it. And he goes like, okay, I'm ready to do another take. And he would do another take. Uh, and then he, if we just, and then he had to go perform with Iron Maiden. Jesus. Yeah. And then the next day, we had four songs to go, and he was not doing well at all. But he still and showed he, up, and he still recorded. Yeah, he said, "Z, you got any strong coffee?" I go, "Yeah, I just got some really cool coffee from Brazil." I'll, I'll I'll make a pot because normally Brazilian coffee is real little. <laughs> so I was giving them big old fucking cups of coffee, Brazilian coffee, like big fucking American style cups, you know? Yeah. <laughs> seven seven hundred mil worth of coffee, boom. <laughs> and and, uh, and to his credit and to my amazement. He gave me four takes of all ten songs. Dude, that's with extremely broken impressive. Broken ribs. And with a two hour concert ahead at night. Yeah. Yeah. Man, honestly, how I mean that's 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 subhuman in many ways for any singer on the planet, right? It's just No, it's, it's just, beyond that. He has as you know, you follow Bruce's career, you know that he can't stand still. Yeah. And, you know, I really, I don't envy him in any way, but I tell you what, I couldn't have done it. I don't think that many people, I mean, I don't think it's hard to believe that, you know, somebody is going to go and record an album with that level of quality and go and perform a concert at night which brings into question something that I am very interested in and very rarely people talk about it would he go in the studio and do any vocal warm-ups any uh, 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 warm downs and then was there anything in particular that you would see because you obviously produced and worked with so many amazing metal singers throughout the years was there anything in particular that you would see that uh, any vocal hygiene that you would see him doing, that you would be like, ah, oh, okay, that's something different than all of the others that he's doing it, that he's aiding. Obviously, that he's an extremely talented guy. We don't need to go into that. But um, anything in particular that you would see, okay, great. Yeah, he knows better than the other guy. So that's why, as well, he's been able to, to do what he did, deliver me four tracks, four uh, uh, takes of each song, and still go and perform a two-hour Maiden concert, which is not easy for anybody in the world to do. No, he... Uh, I mean, he has certain techniques that I've learned that have helped me as a singer. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I don't consider myself a singer, but I learned a lot from him and Rob Halford and Sebastian and Axel. And I'm able to see the little things they did. One thing that I saw, Bruce would warm up for about two minutes. Not even that, a minute. But one thing he did do, and I don't know how to explain this without having a visual, but he would stretch his face 
and open his mouth and his jaw and stretch his face to almost grotesque looking like I don't know it was like figures these figures of him just like he would stretch his face and do weird shit with his neck without a sound coming out in his jaw and he'd open his mouth as big as he could and he like his head like everything was just like just molding and then he and then and then for like a minute minute and a half he pop a sound out and he goes all right that's it let's go z wow yeah it's, it's like w- one day i'll show you the, the faces the fucking faces <laughs> he makes you are going like holy shit what the fuck is he doing like, <laughs> like, this guy's is fucking is he having an epileptic attack or something <laughs> <laughs> it is impressive because when you think about it like um i myself as a singer and as many other singers that you probably worked with uh everyone is kind of like different but there is um <clears throat> there is um most of the singers would definitely take their time and 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 warm up it's kind of like going into sports right if you're a basketball player if you're a baseball player if you are any yeah. if you're in the professional league you don't just jump in the field and start playing Every single one goes through a very specific, regardless if you need more than the guy next to you, everyone stretches, everyone warms up their body in order to jump into that field and perform at its best. And uh, and I always uh, believed, and, and, and I obviously... Uh, um, have, I studied classical singing for many years, and 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 I, I have never seen and I've never see, uh, understood any different than okay, you're gonna record, okay, you're gonna perform to that kind of level because singing metal and rock in general, it's not an easy task for anybody. So you kind of have to get not only your mind in the right place, but you do need to get your pipes, you know, right. You need to kind of like get your body on it. And Bruce is one of these guys that he never really followed anything. He never really like, he was never the kind of guy that would go an hour before the concert and lock himself in the, in the room and start doing warm ups. He's mm-hmm. just the kind of guy that, you know, in five minutes and he's ready no. to go. Five minutes, two minutes, five minutes. And you go around and like, he's like, oh, okay, I got it. Rob Halford's even crazier. Is he? Yeah. He doesn't do shit. He just goes to the mic and sings. No way. Yeah. Crazy. I was going to ask, cause did you, on that album that you did with Sebastian, Angel Down, and then Axo recorded, I think, a couple of tracks on that album. Three w- of them. Were you, three songs, yeah? Were you, did, did you record at Axel? Yeah. You recorded Axo. Uh, that yeah. must have been a surreal experience, right? Because having that guy at the time, that was before uh, the, um, the 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 last album came out, well, uh, the Chinese Democracy album came out. By that point, nobody knows where Axel is. If he's, even if he's still alive, nobody sees the guy. And then all of a sudden, he comes into your studio to record uh, a few tracks. How was that experience? I mean, and, and did he warm up or was he one of those guys that just showed up and sang like crazy again he didn't warm up and you you had to be really engaged and focused because axel has uh if he at the beginning he had no patience uh and he thought he could just do it in 15 minutes Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. He's like, "What? What? What's wrong with what I just did?" And I said, "Look, the first line, the the first couple words of the first line are uh, flat. I go the next couple of, of words in the first line are, are rushed." I go, and then you're trying to adjust for the flatness for the next line, and you go sharp. And I go, in this line right here, you kind of got it in the groove, but you're still a little out of time, and then you worry about the words, and then you rush the next line. He goes, play it back for me. 
and he heard everything I said. And he goes, okay, let's do it again. <laughs> and from that moment on, he didn't question me. <laughs> he trusted you. Excellent. Yeah, because I pointed out exactly what was wrong with, you know, mm -hmm. he's like, what was wrong with, he like, but he was very aggressive. He's like, what? What's wrong with that? And being Axel, it was the first day he brought over all these models and all these people mm -hmm. and like a whole bunch. It was like it turned into a party. <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved and to be there. And I'm having to tell him this shit in front of all these people. Oh, right. I see. So there's a bit of an ego play in there as well, right? Yeah. So the next session, he didn't bring anybody except his manager. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and even she was... And even her, his manager and 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 her and her kids, mm -hmm. and 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 even then he was like he was like uh, I think he told them like to come back you know because mm -hmm. it was gonna get serious mm -hmm. and we got a lot of cool stuff done and um and then uh, and then we did one more session uh, and. Uh, me and Sebastian, we decided to smoke a joint. Because <laughs> Axel said he'd be there at five, dude, and it's one in the morning. And we're like, he's not going to show up. Dude. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> he's not going to show up. Like, we've been waiting. We have been waiting, you know, to smoke a joint. We've been uh, waiting, 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 waiting. <laughs> and we finally go, fuck it, dude. Let's spark it up. <laughs> like, we were tired. We were just waiting and waiting. And, and Axel, by um, this point, is supposed to be there 5 p.m. And this is 1 a.m. <laughs> yeah, it's like 1. I'm like, dude, ain't going to show up. Like, But he kept texting Sebastian, like, I'm on my way still. Like, he's like, dude, where in the fuck are you? Like, are you in fucking Saudi Arabia or something? <laughs> like, you're on your way. Like, we've been waiting for you. <laughs> no, nah, he's like, he's texting back. No, nah, I got this and that and this and going on. And we're like, whatever, he ain't going to show up, dude. I go, I go, Sebastian, just light up your joint, bro. I, I go, I need a couple of hits, bro. I'm, I'm, I'm fucking tired, dude. I've been waiting all day. And we did other stuff and everything. And mm -hmm. then so literally I shut down the computer and then the door buzzer rings. Bzzz. Yeah, who is it? It's Axel. Let me in. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so here we go turn on the computer so, yeah turn on the computer i'm stoned i need coffee now <laughs> like <laughs> you know it's like fuck man like really <laughs> but you know uh axel was so great axel and rob halford have one thing in common that they have a lot of different voices mm. they have Vocally, they can transform into so many voices, you know, and uh, and all I can say is Axel killed it, and then uh, we had breakfast, and then we had Cuban cigars. and Amazing. So you guys stayed up all night, basically. So we did the recording and went all the way straight into breakfast. Six, six in the morning. Uh, I love it. I love it. Sounds like my kind of night. <laughs> <laughs> and but it was but what was cool is that by then Axel had put down his guard and he just was he was just having fun mm -hmm. you know and that to me was a, a you know I, I call it to get a singer's trust is a bit of a conquest mm -hmm. and especially one like Axel to get his trust mm -hmm. was for me i felt really good after that amazing did um, you did you keep in touch with him somehow afterwards or just away? yeah yeah but all i could say is once they found out i knew how to speak portuguese his managers didn't want me around <laughs> 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 Excellent. Let's leave it to that. Let's not get into it too much. <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs>
<laughs> right, my friend. I want to be mindful of your time. Uh, we already went a little bit over than what you probably expected. Well, you can I am... edit it. You can edit no, it. No, 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 no. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not for me. I'm just mindful of your time because mm. I'm just mindful of your time. I, I, I mean, I could go three hours edit. with you. I'm sure. No, it's not going to be edited. Edit. This is. This is going to be what. It. This is a one take show, my friend. This is all going. <laughs> okay. But well, I have. I have a well, few. Have, well, ask me like. Like, I ask will, me something I will. that you always wanted to know. Something that I all, really always wanted to know. Um, to be honest with you, I think just having this amazing insight. Like, I am really interested in those uh, uh, details about the recordings with all of these guys, you know, because obviously those guys are heroes of mine as well. You know, like recording Bruce and then recording Axel and Sebastian and, and you know, just, just those stories for me, they are very insightful. And, and like, for me, something that would be extremely interesting to know, and you already already said was already mentioned it the fact that these guys don't do any warm-ups i would be curious to know if they did what would they do what would be if they followed any kind of like routine you know if if you know axel would ring the bell get in your house and say okay great now i need a quiet room because i have to follow uh whatever you know a certain procedure in order to get myself ready to sing because that's a lot of what you hear about a guy like him you know being late for shows and stuff like that that doesn't happen anymore these days but happened in the past that the guy followed a, a sequence of activities per se you know like he would go into a therapist and then he would do some exercises then he would do warm-ups and then he would be ready to go on stage those are the details that i would be extremely uh, curious to know and and somehow you already I think he does that now i think he does that now mm -hmm. from what i understand i know i know he took early on i know he took sebastian uh with him a lot because sebastian would help him warm up and sebastian, sebastian warm up would... he does warm up then oh sebastian warms up big time mm -hmm. sebastian is very methodical uh you know as you know sebastian uh uh, was on Broadway, mm -hmm. and um, and that gave Sebastian a lot of uh, discipline, is what he told me anyway. Mm -hmm. And and Sebastian would always warm up, and he would take at least an hour mm -hmm. uh, of warming up. And he would always want to record in the morning, which is weird. Exactly. But he goes in the morning. In the morning, I have a baby voice that's clear. Mm -hmm. And so certain songs I want to record early in the morning. Are you okay with that? I said, no problem. Mm -hmm. And and certain songs we would do late at night to get more gruff. And so he understood his body. But Sebastian, working on uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde on Broadway really helped Sebastian. Mm -hmm. And Sebastian didn't need to look at lyrics. Wow. He knew in the studio. He knew his lines. Wow. That's yeah. impressive. That's impressive. Very disciplined. And he had a vocal coach that he turned Axel on to, and that's what helped Axel get his vocal technique a little more solid. Do you know the and name of the coach? Uh, I, I, I can get it to you. I can't think of it right now. Okay. But I know that's why he would have Sebastian. Not only was Sebastian his friend, but he would – uh, wind him up. So in other words, Sebastian would open the show and Axel would watch and it would get him going and he'd remember the techniques from the teacher and he'd warm up. Mm -hmm. And then so by the time Axel got on stage, he he would be dead on the mark. And I have to say that I don't think Sebastian time-wise was ever the same since working with ACDC because I think ACDC would not handle him being late. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You mean Axel, not Sebastian? Yeah, it's Axel. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Axel, Axel learned how to be on time, I think, because a, I think. My theory, mm -hmm. no, I don't know. I can't speak for him. Yeah, yeah. But I think ACDC helped him be more professional Yeah. as far as his being Stage time. prompt. Mm-hmm. And it was extremely impressive what he did with ACDC. I don't know if you if you had the chance to see any of those concerts, but my goodness, I was I mean, it was one of the most impressive uh, concerts that I have ever witnessed, and mostly because of that guy filling in, you know, um, Brian Johnson's 
you know, shoes, and it was extremely impressive. Mm -hmm. It was one of the best vocal performances I have ever witnessed. And I think he was killing it every night from what I could see online, from small videos that I saw it online as well. Um, and let's face it, Jesus, I mean, when when the announcement came, a lot of people, you know, turned their noses to it. But let's face it, who else in the world would have been able to sing? I mean, and uh, to fit in, fill in the shoes of Brian Johnson, you know, I can't think of many of many singers and I think he did it brilliantly. So amazing. But I would I would I would have tried out John Fogarty. Oh well, there you go. That's <laughs> that's an idea. <laughs> but anyway, bro. Uh, Great. Let's just cool. do a couple more questions. Of course. And you know what? You know what my last question is. I know. I know. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get to that. I have a couple of roller coaster questions for you, which are just okay. very short questions with very short mm -hmm. uh, uh, answers. Uh, what's your view about money? Money, uh, unfortunately, is a necessary evil. Good. I actually agree 100%. Um, what would someone say, someone who doesn't like you, Roy? What someone that doesn't like Roy would say about you in your mind? This is a very, you know, that very uh, particular question. You don't even have to think about uh, what somebody ever said about you it's you like pointing the finger to yourself and say you know what i think they would say that um i don't know i eat with my mouth full and i keep my mouth open when i'm eating and they don't like that for example anything like that uh, well people would say this the first thing they would say is like he's he's stuck up but in but what, what it really is i'm just very shy to new people mm-hmm so people take that as being stuck up or thinking that I'm better than everybody else, but it's not. Mm -hmm. If um, I'm always a little bit evasive of new people, mm -hmm. I'm just shy. Um, cool. I don't know. And the the, the uh, what's the the other thing is uh, sometimes I when I say things. The strike a nerve because mm -hmm. I'm very observant. I also studied psychology, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's what's helped me be a producer as well. And all I could say is, uh, I've during working with all these bands and all these personalities, I can see who's going to give me trouble. I can see who's going to be the, the good guys. I could see who the leader is. And the bands don't even know that I could see that. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, within 24 hours, I know what is what. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, the best thing to do is just be yourself around me. Very good answer. That's that's great. That's amazing. And um, I mean, I didn't really want to tap into it. It's very recent, but I think it's inevitable because you obviously you worked in the past uh, with Angra, which are great friends of mine, and I'm super lucky to, 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 to work with them and have their trust for so many years. And you worked as well with um, not only them, but Andre Matos, which uh, unfortunately, uh, just yesterday, we, we heard the news that, um, that he passed. And um, it's, it's a very, very tough moment for, for anyone that, uh, uh, that knew the guy that was close to him or that has worked with him or, or just uh, for the fans, not just, but like, you know, for the fans as well because of the, the amazing, you know, music that that guy produced alongside of other people. But, you know, he was definitely uh, an icon uh, at the time and he will, he will always be. And, and I knew that you guys were close friends and um, I don't know if you if there's anything you, you want to say about it. Well, 
Uh, it, it broke my heart. And my heart's still very hurt. Uh, but I really want to say my condolences to his family. Um, I can't imagine, you know, anyone losing their son or daughter uh, bef before before they go, um, and so I, I I think about his family. Um, I think about all all of his real close friends, and I didn't know all of them, but I knew most of them uh, because Andre had a very very tight circle. Um, he wasn't very. Uh, he was a very shy guy and very kind of quiet. Uh, but if he knew you, he would show his other side. And um, I feel my condolences to his true friends and my condolences to his fans. Um, and and my my heartfelt wishes to his doubters because over the years he had a lot of doubters um and i think now zooming out and looking at it he left an incredible body of work uh, for me personally uh he was like i was like his big brother he, he loved to see me all the time. I was in Sao Paulo or wherever we were, Curitiba, wherever, and anywhere in the world. And he would, like, ask me, like, hey, what do you think about this? Hey, what do you think about that? Hey, I really need you to hang out with me tonight. I really need your help. And... And there'd be times where I go like, "Hey, Andre, I I need to talk to you, man, because you're the only one that would understand." And he would listen to me, and he would tell me what he felt. And I'm gonna miss that. Um, and I think for Brazil, my I have I have a big pain in my heart for Brazil too, because. Right in front of you the whole time, you had one of the most incredible singers on the planet. And not only a singer, but as a, as a concert pianist, as a writer, as a performer, entertainer, he's going to be missed. And uh, in closing, I'd like to say that... Uh, I would like to do at some point a tribute to him when the time is right um, because we were brothers from another mother and but at the same time I knew his feelings on different things and he was a good man a righteous man. And I don't think anybody could say anything bad about him. Yeah, man, just just hearing you speak about him now, um, just, yeah, I'm just kind of like lost for words, really. It's, it's one of those things that it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while to to really digest and comprehend and, and understand that the guy is not there anymore. And, and it's really interesting, really funny how how life is, how, you know, um, fragile we are. And, 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 we, and, and I think looking, I always try to look at things with, from a positive angle, even when there's only darkness in, 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 in front of, in front of the, the, in front of the situation. But, 
but you know it puts things into perspective makes us like uh today for example i i, I found my mom you know i talked to my mom something that i don't do regularly and because you never know tomorrow man you never know tomorrow and and it's you know like uh anger they were like this week uh andre finally after 20 years accepted to talk about finally reuniting with the guys and you know and and doing some music together again maybe but like celebrating 30 years of band literally this last week you know that's and this conversation was going to take place this following week and anyway that's something that we will never know now but uh but really makes us think you know sometimes we think that we are immortal we're gonna be here forever and then and when time comes, that's something that, you know, uh, sometimes you can do and live your life the best as you can from, from your knowledge and, and try and be healthy and active and blah, blah, blah. And be, you know, gentle with alcohol and substances and whatever you, you want to do in life. And, and you still think that you're doing the right thing. But when, when time comes, man, like it just it just comes and there's nothing that you can do about it. Uh, but I'm sure that his name and his legacy are totally untouched and those will carry on forever because those are just you know that's he will live on forever in our hearts and on the hearts of fans and and i'm sure of that roy my friend i can't thank you enough for taking the time today this sunday it's the end of the sunday for me here today in london but it's the beginning for you over there in los angeles I wish you all the best. I hope it's not going to take another six months, another year for me to get to see you again. I'm sure it won't. I'm going to be in Los Angeles more often uh, from from a very near future onwards. I'm sure of that. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to publicly say that I truly admire you. And I still remember the first time we met and, and you playing with my band and we're doing those clinics and via Renato. Our good friend Renato Tribute, which just now uh, helped me as well in in Brazil, book some clinics for Phil Axe, Bon Jovi's guitarist, and and somehow you know here we are, those many years later having this conversation, this open conversation, which again I, I truly appreciate and I'm, I'm I'm grateful for your time, and I wish you all the best and whenever you need me for whatever in life you never know, uh, just count on me, man, just count on me. Well, cool, Carl. In closing, I just want to say, uh, yeah, uh, I believe Andre, Andre's legacy was is more than cemented, uh, and um, I also want to say that, uh, you know, I still remember the other day I was with your, you and your band Serlata, and uh, down in the south of Brazil, and. Uh, I know you've come a long way, man. I'm really proud of you. Uh, I know you're very active, doing lots of different things. And uh, I have one question for you. Go ahead, shoot it. When are we going to hear your new album? <laughs> oh my God, that is a very good question. <laughs> Do you know what, Roy? This is something that most people probably don't come to you because that's you, you know. But I'll tell you something. I've got a bunch of songs, man. I might just play some of, of them to you and, you know, you never know. We might end up doing something <laughs> with those. Well, there you go, mate. Let's do it. <laughs> very good. Do you know what? That's, that's, very, that's a good inspiration right there. That's very inspirational. And I love the fact that you just... Uh, question that and uh it's something that i slowly uh you know recently have been putting some some more thought into it and i'll i'll, I'll talk to you about lots of of my ideas and things that i have in mind um soon but thanks for making that question because that might trigger something within this guy over here and and that album might see the light of the day we never know you never know, my friend. Well, listen, thank you for the interview. The best of luck with the Carousel Circus, right? That's what it's called. <laughs> roller Coaster. Carl's Roller, roller Coaster. Co <laughs> sorry, Roller Coaster Circus. <laughs> I knew I was close. Carousel was close. 
I knew it was a ride. <laughs> it has been a hell of a ride for both of us, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, we still have plenty of time on this planet. I'm sure we both have to enjoy, to share more beautiful moments in life and and to eventually, you know, do more magic uh, with music as well. Yeah. Well, I'll leave you with this. I'll say, uh, muito obrigado, irmão. Muito, muito obrigado pela, pela entrevista. É... Você é um cara que eu estou muito orgulho, orgulhoso de você. E, uh, cara, você sempre tem um irmão em mim. Muito obrigado, Roy. Um beijo. Love you. Love you too. Até. I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation, this podcast, as much as I did doing it. So, if that's the case, please do follow on Instagram at RollercoasterCarl, myself at Carl Casagrande, on Twitter, same thing, Facebook, same thing. Uh, do subscribe. Do subscribe on iTunes, subscribe on Spotify. That's very, very much appreciated. Thank you and have a great, great day. Cheers. Bye-bye.